You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I'm talking to Paco Calvo. We're going to be talking about the philosophy of plant neurobiology and the MINT lab, the Minimal Intelligence Lab. So, Paco, thanks for coming. How are you doing today? Hi, Richard. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So you're studying plant intelligence, is that right? I do, yeah, yeah. I know it sounds awkward, but that's what we do. <laughs> well, you know, I've spoken to some people that work with plants, and in many ways, uh, plants seem unbelievably intelligent, especially in how they can create chemicals to defend themselves. And um, there's far more to plants, I think, than anyone thinks. So, but, uh, but let me know your interpretation. What what fascinates you about plants, and what you, what got you into working with them? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I guess that the the starting point is definitely that we suspect that plants are smart, right? They've got to be intelligent; otherwise, they wouldn't be here, right? So, so in a sense, they've got to be intelligent uh, to have passed their genes, right? But I guess right. that we don't quite understand what we mean by that. So we, what do we mean by intelligence? Or what do, we, what do we mean to say when we say that plants are intelligent, right? So, for example, this thing about the chemicals and, the, you know, all these things, uh, well, that could be just be interpreted as, a, as an adaptation, right? You might just say, well, you know, yeah, sure. I mean, they behave adaptively. But that might not deserve the label intelligence, right? So I guess we need to to you know to do some work, both theoretical and empirical, to really uh, grasp what it means for a, an organism, for a living system, to be to be intelligent. So that's what we're after. Okay. So what are some examples of uh, plants that they really impressed you? That you know made you feel mm-hmm. like, wow, this this has to be. There has to be a lot more here than than we're seeing initially. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, uh, generally speaking, I mean, any pattern of behavior that is anticipatory, so is, in a sense, they are uh, predicting future outcomes and is goal-directed and is flexible enough so that it's not hardwired, like, you know, responding to environmental sources of stimulation on a one-to-one basis, Right. So like the cartoon, the cartoon picture of plant behavior is like, you know, they sense gravity, they grow downwards the root, they sense light, so they behave phototropically. That's the cartoon version. The truth is that things are a little bit more complicated. So they have to integrate all this information coming from all these channels and somehow provide a, a response that is globally adaptive, right? So, so the, the examples, the, the examples in particular, that's a thorny issue because for one thing, we miss most of what plants do. And that's our real hurdle. Mm, to be able to observe their, this sophisticated behavior that they are able to exhibit. And we simply miss it because, well, because of the scale of observation, their time scale, our time scale as observed. Here, for example, uh, at the Minimal Intelligence Lab, what we do is we time-lapse uh, plant uh, behavior. 
When we say plant behavior, we mean their patterns of growth and development. So we have a plant, we time lapse it with a camera. So we take a picture like every minute, every five minutes, and then we assemble a footage after a few days. And then when you do that, so when you slow down your scale of observation to, to the behavior, to the time scale or their behavior, then you are able to start unearthing some patterns which are really interesting. In particular, in our case, we are especially interested in climbing beans or climbing plants in general. In, in particular, the, the climbing bean is the, uh, one of our models. And here we try to understand how is it that they control if they happen to do, because that's another issue, whether it's actually the case. So, But the working hypothesis is that they might be controlling endogenously the approaching maneuver. So the way they target a, a support, a pole, a host, no, somewhere, some, some support to climb onto and trying around like good climbers do, right? And, and, and we try to understand uh, how is it possible for them to do it without a brain because we've got to remind ourselves that they don't have a nervous system. So how are they able to do it? So that's one of the challenges and, and the climbing being in this case or vines in general are, you know, a challenging example of, of non-neural intelligence. So what have you observed? You know, I, I guess you set up a whole bunch of plants or climbing beans and a whole bunch of poles and then you've watched using time lapse how the um, their stalk would approach the pole and wrap around it. Hmm. Look for a, uh, you know, behaviors that tell you if it's sensing the pole and deciding whether to wrap around it at a certain angle and, you know, sure. or just blundering around and feeling the pole randomly. I mean, like, sure. like, what have you observed specifically when you've looked at this kind of stuff? Well, here, I mean, we do two things, actually, it's a technique I was telling you about. On top of that, we are also registering the electrical activity uh, going on throughout the plant body with the electrodes. We insert electrodes uh, throughout the stem. Um, so by combining these two techniques uh, of observation, we are able to gather more data and try to find correlations in between the overt behavior that we are able to observe through time-lapse footage and the under, underlying electrical activity. Now, we've got to be a little bit cautious here, right? For one thing, um, right now, right now, I would say I'm more interested in, rather than in providing, a, you know, like a set in stone answer, which we don't have yet, and hopefully we won't have for a long time. And by this, I mean that in science, we should be more interested in the type of new questions we are able to, to put on the table rather than the, you know, mainstream or orthodox answers we are able to provide. So at this stage, I'm even more interested in, in trying to unearth uh, new patterns of behavior, uh, things that we weren't expecting them to do. And at, in that sense, we are, you know, we've been time lapsing around the clock for the last uh, couple of years. Um, and we want to hold it back and, and be careful enough, you know, not to not to overinterpret the data. We want to be careful, very careful, and, and avoid, you know, anthropomorphic biases. Because for one thing, the way, in a sense, when you are watching time lapse uh, footage, uh, you can't help but you know project your anthropocentric. Uh, biases and preconceptions onto the footage you're watching. So we, not, we need to be very careful and then we need to, you know, to sit back and relax and, and think of themselves, of the subject models and not of ourselves as observers. So we, for example, now we digitize, we digitize all the, fr all the, all the time lapses frame by frame and so that we can track down the, the actual trajectories and then see the patterns of acceleration and deceleration so take, for example, if you see the vine approaching the pole, you might uh, expect them to, to accelerate or to decelerate gently as, as think of a, a bird landing on a perch. So, so to speak, they might be doing the same, but we don't know. And this is a, a, a complex issue. So at this point, we are trying to collect as much data as possible before we, uh, we are able to, you know, to make a pronounced pressure. Well, if you have years of time lapse data already, uh, you're not analyzing it, or are you analyzing it? Like, what have you seen so far? What are some interesting yeah. things you've seen? 
Well, we we suspect um, we suspect that there is um, definitely a form of endogenous control, uh, which means simply bump onto the the host or the pole, so they don't simply you know circumnotate. So the pattern of circumnotation, this is the type of movement all plants exhibit. Actually, any plant organ. So could it be flowers, leaves, stems, tendrils, roots, shoots? So any part of a plant grows by performing this motion of revolution, right? The pattern of circumnotation it revolves around as cells elongate differently, right? So one one you mean, cells you, you mean, uh, wait, 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 you mean a, a tendril will spiral outwards in a direction? Is that what you mean? Instead of yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, going this, straight, it spirals out. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So they revolve around. Um, and in a sense, uh, well, that's that's the regular pattern, right? So in that sense, as remember, we were talking before about we about a behavior that is merely adaptive. So you might say, hey, no big deal about it, right? So vines certainly are in the business of climbing around hosts. So definitely those that are good at that are the ones that pass their genes, right? So in a sense, we want to to put some pressure on them even if artificially, in a, of course, in an experimental setting, but see how they are able to cope with uncertainty, with contingencies. Put it this way, put it this way. Um, we Remember, we were saying that plan behavior on top of being adaptive is got to be anticipatory or predictive or goal-directed, right? So another way to put it is that precisely because plans uh, operate on a slower time scale. Uh, they, in a sense, they can't afford to miss, right? So imagine you, you human or an animal, you might say, hey, uh, you know, I, I can perform this pattern of movement. I can try to grasp the, the mug or just the pole or whatever with my hand. So I stretch out and then reach, try to reach out. And then if I miss it, I can try again, no? In their case, because because they don't, they don't move by locomoting towards the target, but rather by growing towards it, right? they m might not be able to have a second chance the way animals do, right? So because they are sessile and they are rooted and the way they deal with their environment uh, is different from ours, they might not be able many times to have a second chance. So in that sense, anticipatory behavior is a must. So they can't afford to miss. And that's why they have to be somehow endowed with smart mechanisms or ways of dealing with 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 those uh, goal oriented uh, needs that they have right so in a sense what we see uh, oh, okay. I, I yeah sure go on have you done an experiment where a plant will grow towards a pole and then you move the pole and see how the plant reacts yeah that's, we, that that's be a simple test yeah, that's on, on the agenda. Uh, well, uh, um, yeah, that, I see what you mean by being simple, but believe me, it's anything but simple. Uh, well, yeah, that's definitely on our list. Uh, we have many, many experimental variations we are trying. Um, we don't, uh, as I, I insist, we don't want to be, uh, be careful because uh, there are so many things that, you know, so many alternative explanations and it's so easy to fall prey of confirmation biases that we don't want to fall into those biases. So say, say, uh, actually, you know what happened to me once? Uh, you know, I had this, well, this, this vine. Okay. I said the, the time lapse, uh, the settings, I, everything was ready to go. It was a Friday. And I said, well, perfect. I mean, I, well, this is, by the way, this is not like Darwin, right? So Darwin would make observations to the naked eye, right? So he would have to be real patient and be there all day long, you know, marking on the glass. He was using a glass plate technique, like marking, aligning the, the, the tendril or the tip he was interested in with the background point. He would align them and then mark it on a glass uh, in front of the plant. And then he would need to do that on a regular basis. So he, he had to be there, right? So in our case, time lapsing is much easier. On a Friday, I just set, prepare the settings, a picture every minute, off we go. And then I can go for the weekend and, and relax. And then when I come back on a Monday, I can check it out what is done for the last 48 or 72 hours, right? So, so this is what happened. Once I got back to the, uh, I got back to the, to the lab one Monday morning and there was, you know, the vine was, here was the pole, 
the vine was uh, lying on the 180 degrees from the pole. So it just it had just gone the opposite direction, right? Complete opposite direction. And mm. I realized uh, how lucky I had been in this case. You know why? Because imagine that the vine happened. Imagine it had happened to land onto the pole. So the way it was, but the other 180 degrees, right onto the pole. I might have thought, hey, look at that. It went straight for the pole. But now, because it had gone right the other direction, I was able to understand what's going on, what was going on. In this case, I, I found out that the matter was, it could be explained simply on, on, you know, it was a matter of physical constraints. It seemed that the, the, the soil in the pot uh, had been soaked far too much when we watered it. And it had, it had lost uh, stability. So it didn't have any support and it just went all the way down because of the water, because of the pot, the soil was so soaked. So, but imagine I was, I said I was lucky because this way that allowed me to control more carefully about the way to water the pots and everything, how to hold the stems without interfering with their natural patterns of growth. But if in this case, the plant had gone all the way towards the pole by mere coincidence, I might have overinterpreted the time lapse and say, hey, look at that. It went straight for it, right? So that's a very stupid example, of course. That's something that if you have proper controls, you are able to discard, right? If you time-lapse systematically. But the amount of, of parameters that you have to deal with, uh, it's, it's enormous. So around the clock, and there is always some other alternative explanation that you have to take care of. So that means more pilots, more controls. So the case which you were telling me about the shift in the target, we are definitely working on that as well. So all combinations, uh, including different genotypes, because not all climbing beans behave the same way. So different genotypes, uh, different photo, the photomorphology uh, affects as well. So the way plants shape up their plant body out of the light regime, so how light affects the way they grow. So because they are reaching the pole by growing taller, then they, you know, there will be a displacement of the center of mass, and that's going to affect the way they change this initial pattern of circumnotation into the elliptical trajectory they would follow when they are targeting the pole. Uh, as you move the pole, it, it, it also bears... Uh, um, not just the shifting of the pole, but how you are uh, the the temporal scale in which you are moving the pole, because it's got to be within the reach. So that's to say, you might think they are missing the pole when you move it, but it's got to be within the reach. So in terms of their patterns of growth. So, and that in turn has to do with the temperature, the circadian rhythms, because of the way they are regulated. What, what do you mean? What, what do you mean within their reach? Yeah, well, uh, uh, imagine, yeah, if you are if you are moving the target uh, progressively away from the plant to see how the plant keeps trying to target it, right? Uh, uh, she, the plant might be perceiving the support at a distance, which that's another vexing issue. So, what's what sensory modality is involved, right, in their perception? But anyway, leaving that aside for the moment, uh, they might be perceiving the pole and yet not being able to reach it because the the rate of growth is not within the scale of the of the distance you are moving the pole so you might be moving the pole at the at the at the pace which is out of the rate of growth possibilities right so so you they grow as much as they can within their natural conditions if you put it far too far they might not make it not because they are not trying to but because it's without their so you've got to try to make it as uh, the the setting as as natural as possible this uh, in a sense this this also takes us to to you know there is a, always as you know a tension in between in between uh, artificial experimental uh, lab conditions and natural settings right so right. so there are two issues here is is these conditions uh, how how fair they are right you might be testing plant behavior in a setting which has anything to do with their natural conditions and then you might be creating an artifact or 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 making them or actually uh, triggering behaviors that are that wouldn't happen wouldn't take place otherwise or or you might be considering when you time lapse in the open in the wild 
uh, you might be uh, discovering patterns of behavior that simply don't take place in the lab because it's, 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 it's a less rich environment, right? So, so this well, why not many start with the uh, why not start with the initial conditions? Like you mentioned, the good hint you got was that uh, one plant you had watered the soil so much that the soil wasn't uh, structurally stable enough yeah. for it to reach out to a pole. Yeah. So maybe start with conditions there. You know, oh, look yeah, at, sure. uh, plants that have different depths of soil, different uh, you know moisture amounts in the soil, different types of soil. You know, the same sure. plant and see how that affects reaching out for a pole in the same place, the same distance, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I mean, uh, I, the, the, the number of parameters and things you have to bear in mind is, is enormous. So, yeah, yeah, it's this, this thing and it's so many others. So we are trying to, you know, to to take a look at as, as, as many different uh, conditions and settings as possible. So in that sense, you know, you know, you, you were insisting like, well, but what, what have you been able to, to see so far? And, and, and I, I've been telling you that we want to be careful and careful and careful. And the reason is that nowadays um, there is a risk. There is a risk, uh, especially in these fields where, you know, there is in a sense some resistance from mainstream science, from orthodoxy. And, and in a sense, you have like an extra burden uh, of proof, right? Um, and and you know to make the, you know to make a strong claim that plants are intelligent, you need to have real, real, uh, robust data, and you know, and, uh, you know, a very good case. Um, and nowadays, we live in a world of you know, we hect academically speaking, this hec hectic world of, you know, the famous, infamous publish or perish, right? Things like that. And yeah. and I don't I don't want to to play that game. I I want to slow down and take it easy and think enough about it because my interest is understanding what plants are up to, not trying to show or to show that uh, one position is correct and another incorrect so put it this way i don't i don't want to show that plants are able or in this case uh, vines are able to um, control their approaching maneuver as we said before not that but even something which is even more modest i want to first find out whether they do it and in case they do it then to find out how they do it so to do that you cannot be uh, using uh, the opponents or alternative explanations, alternative hypotheses, as you know, strongman, strongman alternatives. So you you want to give your rival, your opponent, their best chance. You have, you want to have a very strong alternative explanation, so that if you do happen to provide a, a good explanation or to have good data that backs up your your hypothesis then it's also robust enough so 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 we want to be i insist we want to be cautious and 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 try to find out about it you know it's 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 all we all we want to do so here is not a, i mean there is a thing for example of i mean now for example the templeton foundation is doing something which is very good very interesting and it's called this uh, you know adversarial um, uh, projects where you you team up you team up with not with the sympathizers of your working hypothesis, not those, the guys that would a priori uh, be willing to buy your 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 theory, but actually you team up with the guys who would be willing to defend uh, another view, so that you can have you know uh, different predictions and and the possibility of of making experiments that will will tell in between them. So that's the way to yeah. go because it's not my hypothesis against yours. It's all of us together teaming up against ignorance, right? So that's what the way I would like to see how we should be doing science. Well, it appears is the neo-Darwinists have a stranglehold on thought, so they want to say everything is random mutation and you know things like yeah. that. And if you're if you're of that thought, then uh, anything you do, they're going to try to pass it off as that. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it appears to be a huge problem. There's, doesn't appear to be, you know, there's, there's, there's much evidence for many more mechanisms of evolution than that. But uh, I don't know if you run into that at all, but you know, I've spoken to many scientists that seem to, uh, unfortunately, live in fear of that interpretation that they'll be made fun of if they don't uh, ascribe to it. Hmm. 
Yeah, um, I don't so, know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a difficult issue. But you know, nowadays again, uh, well, Darwinian. In a sense, we have to go back to to this um, to the botany of the 19th century, and by this I mean, you know, to Darwin. Darwin had a clear insight, which is that uh, botany, in a sense, wasn't subordinate to zoology, right? So, so that's in a sense that's why I think it's interesting to look into plants, not only because we want to, you know, from a basic science point of view, we simply want to understand what they are up to, in the very same sense that we want to understand scientifically any phenomenon in the universe, right? Um, but in a sense, because by thinking differently about plant life, we might be able to throw some more light our on our own intelligence, human intelligence, and rethink those Darwinian uh, uh, terms that we started from, right? So think nowadays with, with all the revolutions in epigenetics and, and many other vexing issues. Uh, but, you know, in a sense, in a sense, we, the, 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 not even plants, but more generally, the whole tree of life, if you put it in terms of the tree of life itself, then, you know, a very complex pattern which in a sense, paradoxically, is a very simple pattern, starts to emerge that basically, and this is what was also underneath Darwin's position, is we are not that special, right? So uh, we are just a tiny end of a branch in the tree of life and something unites us all, right? Uh, take take the very notion of sentience or consciousness, uh, Mm, uh, it, didn't, it, that, it didn't, you know, pop up from scratch in 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 human or other, you know, higher level, higher animals, but somehow it's got to be understood in in terms of the of the very tree of life itself. So, if you allow me to put it in this in this way, I would say that uh, in a sense where there is life, there is already mind, there is already mentality, right? The only problem we have in understanding this motto is that we cannot help but thinking anthropocentrically. And that's the fight we've been we've been fighting this battle for, for centuries. Like, you know, reminding ourselves that we are not the center of the universe. Um, you know, we know the story. I mean, but you know, it seems that the Ptolemeo Copernico revolution, uh, the shifting towards uh, you know, putting ourselves in this tiny corner of the universe. Is, is is happening nowadays in the neurosciences, in the cognitive sciences, in in in, in the brain sciences in general, to try to, to to remind ourselves that we are not that special, right? Maybe plants uh, allows us to understanding or studying plants will allow us to 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 see it under a different light. Well, look, all this being said, anthropomorphic or not, what other behaviors have you have you seen in the footage? You got a lot of footage there, you know. I mean, you tell me one. Yeah, which was yeah. a good hint. But what you know, what else have you seen? Whether you can explain yeah. it or not, that, yeah. that piques well, your curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there are, we work with 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 three plant models. Uh, one is the, the the climbing being I told you about. Then we we also have a, a mimosa pudica, right? This is well, of course, listeners will will know about it, right? The, the guy that falls when you touch it. That's for mimosa. You don't even need to time lapse. You can see it to the naked eye. And then and then we also work on on uh, roots of maize, right? Um, those two other projects, the well, now we started like a, a project this last January um, with these three models. So it's it's those two others are we are at the very early stages, um, and we wouldn't be able to report any any data yet. We are, we are we will uh, soon be able to start doing something, but at least in the case of the climbing. Beam, um, some other behaviors which are interesting. Uh, one actually that I'm really, really uh, um, 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 curious about is that some some uh, beans. Well, these these beans they all mostly all uh, revolve anti-clockwise, right? So they go anti-clockwise, mm -hmm. and then you can see how they are actually actually uh, changing or the circular pattern of circumnotation changes progressively into some elliptical shape 
as they are targeting and approaching the pole. Uh, in effect, when you when you move the pole around, you see there is some actually there is some some uh, reports of this uh, during the 20th century, last century. Uh, all the way, there is actually there is some very good some very good research by by French uh, plant physiologists, which by the way this was a literature that because it was in French and never got translated, it didn't go into into mainstream uh, community. So many many people are not aware of this this literature. But anyway, there is some very good very good literature from the 60s in in France, and here you already have uh, the the. Uh, grasp the understanding that that plants were tracking the 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 target as as you were moving it around right but here what we've been able on top of this what we've been able to observe is that these plants uh, perform a incredibly rapid clockwork direction so if they were revolving anti-clockwise when they touch the the support sometimes okay. uh, rather than rather than making so they miss it they slip through, so they hoops they go i i touch it but then they have to wait and make a whole new circle of revolution before they are able to touch it again right and try to hold on to it sometimes they are able to uh, uh, move backwards so that would be clockwise at an incredible speed and that's something i had never seen before so i have some footage so they reverse their yeah they, they, reverse they did reverse their, it. their spiral back out that's it but but not just that but what really what really uh, grabbed my attention was the speed because usually think that these patterns of this so to complete a whole uh, revolution uh, this is temperature dependent mostly but you know I would say that the fastest lap it takes them like an hour and 10 minutes an hour and 15 minutes the you've seen some of them reverse back out much quicker yeah, than you anticipated yeah. so what's the relative speeds of spiraling in versus yeah. spiraling away that you've seen yeah yeah so so that's that's what really you know I was what, what really uh, caught my eye was that as they were reversing this 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 pattern um, if when they do perform the natural, the the the, the anti clock anti clockwise movement, they might you know it might take them like like uh, an hour and ten, an hour and fifteen minutes to complete a whole circle of revolution. Now, when they reverse after having sensed after having touched the pole, when they reverse the direction of their of their circle notation, they are able to complete uh, like like uh, half of the trajectory which would have taken them like 20 or 30 minutes they are able to do it in one or two minutes so that's that that's unbelievable i've watched this for you know a few few times i i i i joke about it i say this is the usain bolt you know the <laughs> the race right. the, uh, yeah so this is the usain bolt but still I, I go back again to the, to being cautious. I don't want to overinterpret it. It might be, you know, there could be many many possible explanations of this, but this is certainly intriguing. So we want to keep time lapsing and and and, find, and see what we find out. Well, for instance, there you said you want to be cautious. What could be several interpretations of reversing quickly? Uh, hold, say again. What are what are some possible interpretations? You said you want to be careful about yeah. how you're interpreting this. So, what are some possible interpretations that you think would be? Yeah, you know, yeah. That, well, for, for one thing, yeah, sure. For one thing, as as the tendril uh, touches uh, the pole, sometimes you can see how it's uh, some it, there's some tension building up. Right? It's just barely barely touching with the very tip of the tendril is very touching the pole, and it's, it's it keeps it keeps putting pressure to keep moving uh, anti clockwise and then there, you can you see the bending zone the bending zone is 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 curving 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 and is building up some tension so it might be simply uh, be a physical uh, constraint that is like a spring like so it would be it, it would spring back out of uh, to release the tension so it might be just a physical explanation of the phenomenon that's why we want to be extra careful okay uh, well yeah, yeah, here. So you think it may just be what physically all of a sudden it took the plants 20 minutes to do one action, but now for some reason it takes one minute, but that's just something physically going on that's allowing it, allowing it to do it. There's no intent there. It's just a, a reflex somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an alternative explanation, and we shouldn't ignore it.
as I was insisting, we should not make of our, you know, of the contender's position a strawman position. So let's let's give them their their best chance to counterattack, and then we might be able to design other experiments and make more accurate observations and try to discard them, or, or not to discard them, but to to see what's actually going on there. We don't know yet. Mm. Okay, well, well, very good. So, what's the best way for people to um, to find out more about your work, and maybe to get in contact with the lab or, or ask questions? Sure. Sure. What, yeah, should they uh, email? Uh, should they go to a website? What's the best way for people to follow up? Oh, find out more. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, of course. I mean, well, you know, I'm, I'm. I don't know if this is good or bad, but I'm usually on my email, right? <laughs> okay. uh, I people are welcome to to drop me a line, and I I usually will reply. You no, know, I I try to respond to all the emails. If if there are too many, it will take some time for me. So please right. be patient. But but email email I would say the best way to reach out. But of course they can also you know check out my website and and which is a, a minimal intelligence lab. You know here at the University of Murcia. So they can Google me up and 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 see what we are up to. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Paco, I appreciate you coming on the call. It's been uh, it's been interesting. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks, Richard. It was a pleasure. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, but we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.